Welcome back to Neuroconversant Leadership, where we focus on communicating with people who are neurodivergent, which is just about everyone, especially me. I'm Jeremy Doran. I help great engineers, doctors, and scientists become great leaders. Have you ever worked with a very diverse group of people and struggled to get everyone on the same page? Today, we're going to talk about that and more with Tom Dardick. Tom is the principal for Dardick Interpersonal Communication, where he helps people and organizations operate more purposefully. He's a speaker, writer, coach, consultant, and president of a research and development firm. So all in all, a busy guy. Tom, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Nice to be with you. Oh, it's great to have you. Can you tell us more about your company? And within that, I was looking on the website, you can talk about Eye of Power. I'm interested in your company, Eye of Power, and, and what it does. The Eye of Power is the the culmination of really a, the last 20 years of working with interpersonal communication and working to help whether it be leaders or managers or business owners to really affect change and a bunch of things I've noticed along the way. And, um, it was kind of a long origin story. I, I won't go into it at the moment, but came up with a model that sort of encapsulates the things that either uh, move us forward to help us make the positive changes that we desire or that hold us in place that keep us from, from moving forward. And the model itself is a handy tool. It works as a flashlight, a, a map a, and a compass to help us orient in our journey. Um, but I'm not going to say it is um, alone that useful because it turns out that making changes is not really that much of an intellectual exercise, it's, <laughs> no. right? It's not that we don't know what to do or, or that we haven't heard wisdom before. Um, our path forward is an emotional one and it's really demarked by our relationships and, and how we feel both about ourselves and how we're connected to other people. So for that reason, the, I, the, I, we use the model in um, a setting where it's in a cooperative setting, and I call it a protocol. So what that means is we're having healthy conversations that move us in what we call the, the positive direction. And when I mean positive or negative, that's, that's also another paradigm that isn't a complete way to think about things because all things that we do have positive and negative aspects to them. And whether something is net positive or, or net negative tends to be very situational and subjective. So now having said that, some things are, are clearly obvious, but for the most part, it's better to think in terms of being fully expressed, what's inside coming out, being, being less stressed, less distracted, less tethered by distraction and pain and more involved in things like flow, contribution, connection to other people, creative endeavors, uh, things that fill your sails and make you feel like you matter. That is what we all strive for, right? We all want to know our purpose and then be able to fulfill it. So that's great work you're doing. Are you Thank most you. often working with individuals or with teams? Uh, yes and yes. So it's a, this kind of work tends to be an individual sport, but for the reasons I just laid out, Jeremy, it, you really can't do things by our, by ourselves. The, the truth of the matter, and we could look at it sort of a tragic, but in my opinion, it's actually beautiful. We can't see our own blind spots and we really are moved in relationship because of those two things. We need other people. We need each other. And in one way, we can look at it like, oh, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dependent or I can't do things just by myself. Or we could look at it in a little bit of a negative spin if we want to. Um, but really, I think it's a beautiful thing because every single person we encounter has insights, experience, perspective that we lack. And if we get in the habit of showing the respect for the different, we can expand our model of ourselves and the world around us and our blind spots shrink a little bit and we can be inspired by their story, move in a little bit in 
the direction that they have blazed and be a little bit more fully expressed ourselves as a result. You are speaking my language. I often talk <laughs> about finding your lane and then expanding it. And finding your lane is really sometimes what people, like you said, people think of as a negative or a weakness really can be the thing that is your strength when applied properly and, and you lean into it. And then learning to talk to people yeah. who are very different than you, you found your lane and now you get to expand it. And it's, yeah. so this is perfect. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And, and I get excited about this because we're conditioned to think of, the, of our limitations or even the things when we're in crisis or trauma, we tend to think that this is a catastrophe and it's, um, now, no, I'm not saying that look for trauma or look for crisis. No. But what I'm saying is that our big changes for the better tend to come through those types of experiences. So if you're in pain, if you're, if you're in a place where you're feeling isolated, if you're feel whatever you're feeling, um, that doesn't feel good to you has the seeds of being able to help somebody else. And that's where the path forward lies. Nice. I like that. Now you talked about embracing the differences with other people. Um, and in the workplace, that can definitely be a challenge. I know a number of people who are team leaders for for projects, and they are cross departmental projects. Yeah. What do you do to help people knit together a whole team of very diverse people in their ways of thinking and behaving and, and their goals? Even are there things that you set up in order to make that framework more effective? Uh. I think this is a moving target for centuries, if not longer, we've lived in a, I'll call it, I, I usually use the word transactional world where you, you value a skill that I have. It's worth X amount of dollars. You pay me those dollars and expect me to put that skill to work in the shared enterprise that we have agreed to, to pursue together. We're starting to realize that, human beings are not human doings. We are human beings. We're supposed to, we're supposed to enjoy the connection of people, the experience of what we do. And if I'm advising a team uh, leader or anybody who's putting together a group of people, what I'm saying is you've got two jobs. You, you, uh, you need to see the people, let them feel seen, make sure they see each other and align. And you're nourishing the, the whole person so that they don't have that, that background anxiety that I was talking about, where they feel like they can succeed, they feel like what they do matters, and then you, you don't have to squeeze more blood out of the turnip, right? You can, they'll give and give and give and give, and they might do it in less time than you even budgeted for them because you're getting the best of them. You're getting, you're, you're getting the passion, the, the full capacity of them. So um, when you, and we're, this is, you know, people have done this throughout. I don't mean to suggest that this has never happened before in history. I just mean that it's replacing the old paradigm to be in this way of dealing human to human, soul to soul. And so it's that direction that I would suggest um, leaders develop to address the question you asked me about to get a team to function at its highest. There are so many studies about how much better employees are when they feel seen and heard, how much more engaged they are, how much more likely they are to stay on their team. And the one that gets most people, I deal with a lot of engineers and more technical people, and they don't care all that much about feelings sometimes. But when you look at the fact that companies with a high percentage of engaged employees who feel seen and heard financially outperform their competitors by a wide margin, that gets their attention. Yeah. So feeling yeah. seen and heard is just so crucial to making the world roll smoothly. Well, that translates to a sense of belonging. And that translates to a sense of connection and a sense of ownership and a sense of really ultimately meaning and, and, and you can feel like I'm in the right place. I, I feel purposeful. So I can, I can safely 
be myself and put my whole self into this effort. And when you get that paradigm, when you get that paradigm operating, the little problems of the day that inevitably happen, you know, the world is, doesn't, doesn't work with quick fixes and the, and just, you know, easy answers and everything goes smoothly, right? That's not how the actual world is. It's at, we have to be disciplined. We have to work. We, you know, there's, there's things we have to do, sacrifices we have to make, but against the backdrop of that fulfillment, that's the word I use fulfillment. Um, it, those things don't seem so much when you don't have the fulfillment, any little thing seems like a mountain. Right. I like where you're going with this. So when you're working with a team and each person needs to be feel seen and heard, but they're a very diverse group, how do you how do you manage that when everybody wants to be seen and heard in a different way? Well, that's a fantastic question. And how I would say how I would coach somebody, what I'd say, look, you have to look at the universals. And you have to look at the unique elements, both, right? Because all humans share, a, we are so much more alike than different. You know, we all basically want the same things. And to the point where you could almost say there's, there, that we're all the same. At the very same time, nobody thinks the way you do. Nobody has the same walk through your experiences. Nobody's brain works the exact same way. Nobody has felt what you felt, walked the walk you had. And you have a unique sort of set of attributes and capacities that you might not be the smartest. You might not be the fastest. You might not be the best looking. You might not be the most charismatic. You might not be, you know, the most experienced, but you take the things you do have and it creates a unique fingerprint, if you will, that only you have. So what I would say to that, Jeremy, is look there look to the uniqueness of that person and figure out help them figure out really because it's it's all of our own missions in life to to take that inventory develop it to the best we can and figure out how we can most benefit others by leveraging those things in the in the world and so if you're a leader you're helping the person do that specifically around the shared enterprise, the shared mission, the shared, the thing that we're all doing together. We're, we're, that's what I meant by alignment. When I said that earlier, we, we have to get things working so that we're, you know, if we're rowing on a team, right, we got to be in sync and we have to be going in the same direction. Right. So that's the job of the leadership to get that, but making sure, okay, this person belongs up here because their stroke is slightly longer or this person belongs over here because they can, they have a higher rotational ratio, uh, you know, all these little subtleties. That's the, that's the magic of, of, and when you're in that conversation with somebody, they are being seen because you're, that's what the, that's what the process is. That's great. I have been to parks where you see people rent kayaks and most people rent single kayaks, but some people rent double kayaks. And boy, watching those people try to to row a kayak together is either entertaining or horrifying most of the time. Sometimes they figure it out, but you can see why in sculling, I think, in the Olympics, they have someone yeah. in the front keeping everyone together because without that, boy, it can be it can be rough sledding or rowing anyway. It, every exactly everything that seems simple is there's always more to it than meets the eye. Looking again through your website, one of the things you talk about are building healthy cultures in a workplace. I'm interested in how often that is the case that a culture is healthy and or what are some of the obstacles that you see commonly preventing it from being so? Yeah, uh, well, healthy is a kind of a fuzzy word to use, right? Um, the bar out there in general, I'll say is relatively low. And the reason I say that is because it's not that hard to make radical improvements. That's why I say the bar is low. Um, and it's just like all things, Jeremy, if we were trying to measure against perfection, it's so we're so far away. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's intimidating, but to make radical pr improvements that would make huge difference in, in day-to-day -day experience, that is doable. That is close. And I would just say a healthy culture is one where if you are upset with somebody or mad at somebody, 
you're it's okay and you're expected to just go and talk directly to them and if you would go somewhere else and talk to somebody else about it before talking to them that would be sort of poo-pooed and seen as something that you shouldn't be doing so that's a very good measurement of whether a culture is healthy or not because then it's based on trust and mutual respect and i think those are the ingredients to any very healthy culture it, and unfortunately, that is not, I, I'd say that's more the exception than the rule. So that's my answer to your question. But it isn't, it's hard, but, but it's not hard. It's, 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 it takes courage to get from wherever you might be to that place of mutual respect and trust. It takes um, the ability to, to be vulnerable, to be honest. Um, and these things are simple, but not easy because it requires a maturity. It, it requires, uh, you know, you're going to have to realize that amongst any team, you're dealing with a Pareto distribution. You're, you're dealing with, a, or a normal distribution where you're going to have to, as a leader, realize that some will, some won't, and some just need a lot of help. So you're, you know, I say this to leaders all the time. I say, you are going to have to either change your people or change your people. One of the two, <laughs> right? And, and one's up to them, one's up to you. So the leader gets to decide, okay, what are the boundaries here of what's okay and what's not? What's the standards of acceptability and hold people to that? But during that process, you're also giving them the chances. You're giving them the support to be able to move in the desired direction. You you beat me to one of my favorite phrases. Like many things, it is simple but not easy. Yeah, it's that's that's life. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I heard it said recently, and it's been renting space in my brain ever since I heard it. Um, the difference between intelligence and wisdom. I, I'd always thought of it as. Uh, some like I, I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid, and, and these were some of the attributes that you'd roll up for characters. And the difference there was intelligence was for spell casters, and you needed to remember lots of spells and lots of details. Wisdom was for clerics, so that was your faith and your ability to to be true to a to a line. And there's some there's some truth there. But what I heard recently about those two things was intelligence is knowledge about that which changes. Wisdom is, is knowledge about that which doesn't change. And, and that one's been really sitting with me because I think, I think if we're going to develop as leaders, if we're going to develop as individuals as, uh, and, we, and we want to build our wisdom, I think that's a good way to look at it. Like what is true that just doesn't change over the ages? And busy ourselves with that master question. I think that's a good habit to be in. These truths we hold to be universal. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, yep, helped with the Constitution. So there you go. When you're talking about a healthy culture, you, it's not just at companies, it's schools, every organization, and people seem very sensitive these days. And there are a lot of things that, people can find offensive that you may not have intended to be. And I am always happy for someone to say, Hey, I don't like what you just said because X, Y, and Z to me, that's great because now I know that that's something that can offend someone else. And I try not to say it, but when people just get really, really over the top mad without giving the person an explanation of why, or the person gets mad at, being corrected, it just seems like it would be so much easier if you can just have a conversation. Hey, I don't like this word. Please don't use it. Great. I won't use it anymore. So are you seeing a lot of that in companies where you work or is it something different or both? No, there, I think there's a lot of people walking on egg, eggshells because the lens I look through when I think of this issue you just raised, Jeremy, is the lens of respect. Um, I, I mentioned earlier about healthy cultures being based on mutual respect and trust. How do you get to those places? Well, what is respect? To me, respect is recognizing the value of another person. 
And I think the deeper truth, we talked, just talked about wisdom and deep truths, the truth of the mat. And we said earlier about everybody has their unique walk and their unique basket of goodies that only they have. So I think respect in, in, is a big, a big component of respect is understanding that and acting accordingly. So you, you're, you're looking and, and acknowledging the value of a person first. And when you're doing that, that's a respectful gesture. That, and and this, this combs its way into all aspects of our lives. And if we're focused on what's wrong, uh, using a word, using, uh, you, uh, I get upset because of, um, we're not in the highest value uh, question. What we want to do is we want to look at, okay, what's the value here? So even if somebody says something you don't like, there's probably seeds in that that you could actually learn from. And so you might demand respect because you don't want this word used around you, but demanding respect without showing respect is not a winning formula. We all are called to show respect. So I would say everybody must build their muscles in terms of how they show respect. And I think as we do that, some of these problems that we have encountered in our recent days um, of fashionability, which comes out of good intention because we're tr we are trying to show respect, but when we, we, we're just a little bit off, we're, we're like going in the right direction, just slightly off. And sometimes when you're just slightly off, that's where the problems come in because you can't see that you just have to make one little adjustment and now everything works versus it's slightly off and nothing works. So that's the, that's the challenge of today. And, and I'd say, just like I say with anybody I'm sitting with, everything starts with a look in the mirror. What are some ways that people can remind themselves and or exercise the muscle of being respectful uh, to others? Well, that's what the eye of power, I, I formed the company to answer that ex exact question. To me, it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to do unaided. I already said that cha our real change is something that's emotional. So it's a very difficult thing to do just sitting there by yourself trying. It's really through relationship. You know, you, you might've heard it said, we are a, uh, we are a function like our, our income is the average of the five people we spend the most time from people will say that, or, or this is why um, environments and offices tend to have a certain way, right? We individuals, we, we move together because we're social creatures and we're very influenced through our relationships and just the people we spend time with is, is a lot of that. So, uh, the answer to that question is being in, uh, intentional about how we're spending our time together and what we're trying to accomplish together. So the I of power protocol is a system that allows people to have these psychologically healthy conversations as a feature of that organization. So it, it, it's answering that very question by just building that into the cake of how we work around here. Um, short of that, you have to have a group of people that agree and have an intentionality that want to do that, that want to work together to accomplish that goal. You have talked about the I a number of times. Can you share with us how people can find out more about it and more about you? Sure. So the eye of power.com is the website. That's the place to go. Um, I have a podcast myself, eye of power podcast. It's on all the various uh, outlets of, of podcasts where we talk about these kinds of issues. So it, anything that we've sort of shown the light on, there's episodes that will drill down to any of those subjects into, into great detail. Uh, sometimes it's me talking. That's how the podcast started. But um, nowadays we're having conversations like you and I are having, Jeremy, where we, we drill down into like respect and action. And we, you and I could talk about that and that might be a podcast episode, that kind of thing. So Wonderful. I'm going to put those in the show notes so that people Wonderful. can find your webpage and, and your podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So in interest of time, we need to start wrapping up. Sure. Can you tell everybody a place you have traveled to and loved and a place you have not yet been and want to go? Well, the travel to and loved, um, I, I, as I was thinking about that, there's a trip that I 
uh, coming up will be my third time and I don't think I'll ever miss it again in my whole life. I'll have to have something like in, in the way that's either a, a wedding or an illness or some sort of thing. Otherwise, and it's not a destination other than the fact that it's, it's a, a cruise. It's called cruise to the edge and it's, it's in the Caribbean and I don't care where it sails to it, Cozumel grand came doesn't matter. Uh, because the ship itself is the destination. Uh, I've been on two of them. You have 25, 30, 40 bands was on the first one. All these pro- progressive rock bands with all these musicians that I absolutely respect and love. And you get to listen to them and then hang with them and get to meet them. And it's like a, it's like a festival and a after party all put into one in paradise. So that's my absolute highest thing that I've experienced so far. And I'll just continue to do that. A music um, festival on the water. I like yes, it. Yes, that's what it is. And, you know, they have them different for different genres. So there's the Monsters of Rock cruise. There's blues ones. There's, I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds. So whatever your passion is, you could find a group, a tribe of people that all love that same thing. And it's, it's what we're talking about. It's, it's that passion shared. You get a shared sort of experience and all those people together. It's, it just, it's just an environment that is very difficult to, to describe or, or match. So I like it. Yeah. And where's a place you've not yet been? Well, I'm going, uh, in a couple of weeks to, we're doing a cruise in, we're going to Rome. I've never been to Italy. And then we get on a boat, we'll be to Rome for a few days. Then we get on a boat and we go to the Greek Isles, Malta, and back to Italy and a couple places. So we were supposed to go on our honeymoon 27 plus years ago to do that. Never did it. We were buying a company and moving at the time, weren't, weren't comfortable spending that money. So it just never, never happened. So now we're finally doing that. So I'd have to say that's the, the number one thing on my mind now. Those are all great places worth yeah. the wait. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to eat and wa- and drink and walk a lot. Yeah, good. Walk <laughs> off all the food and drink that you've had. Yeah, my wife and I are going to have a great time doing that. So, My second question is, who is a great communicator? And it can be a personal friend or a historical figure, anything you want. Well, when I think of that question, the, the person comes to mind for me is Winston Churchill. Uh, his his career and his, I mean, how much he wrote and spoke and accomplished in his life is, I don't know of anybody else who matches uh, his level. And and then his speeches, I mean, changed the world really, where Britain was on the brink of going out. And I, you know, I don't know of many examples in history that have shorn up people to, to, to carry on uh, like he was able to do, uh, you know, he was a great man and was already sort of on the retirement side of things before World War II started. And he was brought out, he was, they were blowing the dust off him and the mothballs yeah, to got... bring him back. So, and then he sort of had a career after that. And his career was kind of up and down because he was, you know, a polarizing, as anybody who has principles is polarizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but his accomplishments and his clarity of vision and thought, um, I, I don't know of anybody who, who is greater than him. There might be people on his level, but yeah. Wonderful. And then the final question is, what's one piece of communication advice that we can all benefit from? I'm going to circle back to something we said earlier. I'd say get in the habit of building your respect muscle. And, and, and like I said earlier, what that meant is rec- looking for and recognizing the unique value in every single person you're speaking with, get in that habit. And because if you're, if your spirit is in that place, the individual words and the differences between you melt away, they don't matter that much. It's, it's the spirit of connection and really it's the loving thing. It's the thing that says, I see you, I value you. And everybody's worthy of that gesture. So that's a wonderful, I, I think that's, if, if everybody did that, this world would be a whole different story. If every time you were offended by something, you stop and think, what's the opportunity? <laughs> that would just go such a long way and stop the, you know, the such triggered responses. And it would just get people to say, oh, here's a chance for me to educate. 
another person or here's a chance for me to be educated. Yeah. The, the, the triggered to me, I, I mean that, that process when people feel that, um, whatever that feeling is, it, it's, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me because they, they're, they're giving their power away. They're, 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 you're, you're not the master. You're, you're, you're the servant of whatever that force is. And, um, it's way better place to be on uh, having our emotions be at our serve us rather than we serve them. So, yep. How you, use, how useful is what you're thinking and feeling right now? Yeah. Yes. It's there a great question. Yeah. All right. Perfect. It has been so great having you here, Tom. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing all that you did. And I'm going to reshare again in the show notes, how people can reach out and learn more about you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. My pleasure too. Thank you so much for listening to Neuroconversant Leadership. If you found this beneficial, can you do me one small favor? It'll be quick. I promise. Can you go and give this podcast a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever it is that you listen before doing anything else, unless you're driving. If you're driving, then I need you to keep driving. And then when you're done and parked, then go ahead and give me a, a review, hopefully five stars, but whatever you are comfortable honestly giving. Thank you and have a great day.